be. And uh, it's lovely to be here on this this summer's day to, to chat sales. Um, and, and we thought it's quite an interesting topic um, that we're going to cover today. Well, we think it's interesting, and, and hence the fact we're covering it, I suppose. Um, that, uh, as we know from conversations in previous weeks, um, sales is an industry that many people are opting not to go into these days. Uh, you know, there are huge numbers of sales roles which are remaining unfilled um, in the UK, particularly actually in the US. I think it was uh, the figure that was bandied around was 700,000 unfilled sales roles. Um, so uh, why would somebody choose not to go into sales? Why would somebody choose to? Ah, there we are. I was, I was going to say better late than never, but arguably not. <laughs> Good morning, Andy. Let's not start there, guys, OK? <laughs> good morning, Andy. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Jamaica. Jordan, nice to meet you. Thanks for not piling in there with sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on my best behaviour this morning. Um, yeah, so, so, so why, why would somebody choose not to go into sales? Uh, so uh, uh, to, to answer the question, uh, we're going to answer it from the other direction, actually. Why would somebody choose to go into sales? Uh, so we're lucky to have Jordan, who's joined us uh, today, who who is a BDR and salesman, uh, and is Alex's son. Now, obviously, being the son of somebody that has a track record of being a successful salesman kind of sets an expectation that that's something that you could do as an individual. Um, but anyway, before we get into the, the meat of the conversation, uh, let, let's let's go around the horn and introduce ourselves. Uh, I, I shall save the best till last. Uh, so, Alex. <laughs> Good morning, all. Uh, Alex Abbott, uh, founder of Sipiro, and as Adam said, father of Jordan. Great to be here. Tim. Hello, everybody. I'm Tim Hughes. I'm the CEO and co-founder of DLA Ignite, and I'm probably known for the, being the author of the book, Social Selling Techniques to Influence Buyers and Changemakers. Uh, that book, it, it, would that happen to be the one that's behind it? It, it would be, yes. Ah, yeah. Marvellous. Are the brands available? <laughs> no, no other prints available, Andy. Um, Andy, uh, always late, uh, never knowingly on time. Good-looking bloke from Cranfield and the ISP. And uh, uh, yes, very true. <laughs> yes, very true. Uh, and and last, but by no means least, Jordan. Jordan Abbott, SDR at Vidyard, and the son of Alex. Oh, and, and, and me. When I say saving the best to last, I was thinking it would be Jordan, but obviously it isn't it's me. Hi, I'm Adam Gray. I'm Tim's business partner and co-founder at DLA Ignite. Uh, so, so, yeah, let, let's let's get into the meat of this, this conversation. Uh, why did you choose sales? You know, because this is, this is a tough world to get into, particularly at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. By the way, we are grading your answer. The four of us just to keep the pressure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's obviously the, the major influencer was was Alex. Um, despite all those holidays where he'd be sitting in the lobby on his computer, um, I somehow was still attracted to, to the profession. Um, but I mean, additionally, I'm I'm a huge film buff, um, and. Uh, I mean, there's been countless great sales films, obviously not portrayed sales in the best of lights, really an education on how not to sell. Um, went away and trained as an actor. That didn't work out. And then I thought, you know what? Try my hand at sales. I think um, really what it boils down to, I just really enjoy connection. Um, you know, that's why I enjoyed about acting is that sort of connection reacting off people. Um, and when done well, that's what sales is all about, right? building those connections, building that trust um, and helping to, well, coming to a mutually beneficial um, outcome. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand that. And, and it's really interesting because in, in that famous uh, uh, Stanford, I think it was, commencement speech that Steve Jobs gave, he said about uh, you can only join the dots looking backwards. And, uh, you know, he said, I did this and I, I went to, to uni and I dropped out of uni. But because I dropped out, it meant I could drop in on all of the other lectures. And it meant that I got to go and see people uh, uh, doing uh, calligraphy and stuff like that. And that helped shape my, my view for how the Apple Mac should work 20 years later. And I guess that, that you didn't go into acting school thinking you were going to be in sales. 
but the fact that you've been to acting school is massively beneficial isn't it when you're you're kind of effectively up on the stage talking to people yeah definitely and i think as well with the way that um with the way things are going building personal brands on social um you know i, I recently wrote a post yesterday actually um about when the, the fact that when I first started, I felt that I had to fill this sort of grey suit, briefcase sort of mould. Um, and I just, I didn't enjoy that. Not at all. It wasn't me. It wasn't authentic. Um, and, you know, since switching my approach, I'm now able to bring those two passions together, acting and sales and, you know, tell stories in, in very outside of the box ways. And I think at the crux of it, that's that's what sales is. It's It's telling a story that resonates with prospects um, to to generate that interest, right? The, 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 so we've got some fantastic comments here. So first of all, this, this one from Karina, if you get sales right and uh, love people, it's one of the best jobs out there. And I know that, Jordan, in our interaction, you went from banging your head against a wall uh, using old methodologies to all of a sudden, and you said, it's just the best job in the world because I'm spending half of my time talking to people for the first time. And, you know, what a great turn. And Danny's comment here about how uh, it's helping people, finding and relieving people's pain. Uh, and it's interesting, isn't it, that there seems to be this real kind of uh, uh, dichotomy here, a real split between people that love sales, that genuinely, you know, as Karina said, if you love people, that's that's the key here. Uh and then there's there's this from LinkedIn user, and we, we don't know who you are. Uh, uh, were well, you not put off by the negative perception of salespeople? So, uh, and were you put off by the negative perception of salespeople, Jordan? I I think that perhaps a little bit initially. So I started out um, working in telesales, um, working it sitting in a call center with a phone calling people, trying to flog them, you know, uh, PVC windows and doors, solar panels. Um, and that sort of put me off because, a, a little bit, because we were sitting in this call centre in Bletchley, Milton Keynes, and there were people that genuinely thought it was like Wolf of Wall Street, you know, <laughs> things in the toilet. And it was just like, you're in Bletchley, mate. Come on. Um, <laughs> sort of put me off uh, in all honesty but I think I, I never really I, I, I guess in the early days my perception of it was what I saw from from Alex you know it was it was never sort of trying to flog you know being sleazy it was all about problem solving building those relationships networking the you know one thing that that you've always spoken about Alex is the, the value of community and building that community of trusted advisors that you can turn to that you can help to solve your, your business challenges so I think that sort of far outweighed those negative perceptions for me at least yeah and the numbers on the whiteboard I guess were, yeah. were sometimes impressive when you calculate the commission yeah exactly <laughs> so, so one of the things that we've been talking about Jordan is um, is purpose and and the fact that um, people are now looking for purpose in in their role um, do you find purpose in your sales role what 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 is it that you what is it that when you get up in the morning and say I'm looking forward to the day ahead of me what what, what is it that you're looking forward to yeah it's a great question um, I think for me it's a little bit of the unknown I never really know what the day is going to hold and I think that that provides me with opportunities to grow and to learn and, and to help other people other people to, to learn um, so I think that's the the thing that, that excites me most no no two days are, are the same no two conversations are the same no two challenges are the same um, so you know you've got to think on your feet you've got to and it's just um, nice to to not necessarily have that one fixed endpoint. It's it's that flow of the conversation, right? Um, if it's not a good fit, then you know I'm not going to force you down the rabbit hole. Um, if it is, then we'll continue the conversation, right? And that's that's great when that happens. 
Um, so yeah, for me, it, it's the, the unknown. So, so we've got a great question here from uh, Neil Johnson. Um, and Andy, you can share a bit of academic light on this as well about the importance of, of uh, coaching and mentoring as opposed to training. Because <clears throat> uh, Andy, you're, you're at, at Cranfield, you're, you're writing a PhD on sales. Uh, so <clears throat> how, how important is coaching and mentoring as opposed to just cramming people with skills that they may or may not use, do you think? I think that's a fascinating question, and apologies, I've been scribbling stuff down because I just love the stuff that you're saying, Jordan, so I wanted to note them before I come back to them. Um, you know, we've got um, Dale Childs, who I spent some time with in Toronto on the course at the morning, uh, Dale, and also Matt Drought, who I've known for many, many years. Um, and, you know, some of the points that are now starting to come out and, and some of my studies and I know Dale's looked at it as well is looking at what they would call knowledge skills and behaviors or KSBs they're banded around quite a lot in in academia um, and I think that it comes down to the B's the behaviors so if you are coached truly properly coached and I don't mean somebody who's read you know the Alex Ferguson how to be a success book um I actually think you get <clears throat> that behavioural change and, and allows people to develop and be reflective and learn. If you just tell someone, well, firstly, Jordan's an adult, so Jordan is not going to react particularly well to being told to be in a classroom. It works okay when you're, when you're sort of like 12 and 13, you need that structure, you know, stop throwing the electric and elastic bands around and the ruler and all that stuff, but it doesn't work well. So I think... Coaching has to be fundamental in, in an organization. If you are going to enable somebody as an individual, and um, Dale, I don't know if you saw um, Maria's post for the direct sales in Canada overnight, um, you know, 52% attrition, and she talked about is enablement the answer. And, and I actually, I we, we've talked about this before, and it starts to fuse things in my head, which is, I don't think we're enabling people, we're enabling revenue. So things that Vidyard may well do, which would be you know, here's sales loft, here's the CRM system, you know, those are enabling revenue. What I want to see is the coaching and then the codification of learning that enables Jordan for the rest of his career. And I think then, back to Matt Drought's thing, is you then start to get this personal authenticity and this personal brand. And that's what we talked about last week in the book Jolt, isn't it? Which is, you know, the personal brand of an individual project, social, but also how to show up back to the Simon Sinek conversation. You know, that's the difference. And, you know, Matt's point around it. If we're not careful, AI will do a whole bunch of stuff for us, but it's not going to help, help the buyer because they're looking for something slightly different. They're looking for Georgian's take on what they need not AI's take. So I think to answer your point, Adam, coaching is massively important. I think most sales managers are poorly poor coaches because they've not had that investment in them. It's really difficult to be a coach because you could end up, if you coach Jordan, you could end up with Jordan one day in six months going, you know Maybe. what, this, this isn't for me. And, and so, that's so, have, so, so have, have you had experience of coaching Jordan and, and has it been valuable to you or have you seen this mostly as training you know learning skills uh yeah no so I think from day one um Alex has been there sort of coaching mentoring me um and then one day probably about a year and a half ago now Alex came to me with an idea and said oh and they're these two old chaps and they, they've got some, some good stuff to say about social and the power of social. And obviously that's how, how we met. Mm. Um, and who would that be, Jordan? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, young and, chaps, you mean? What's that, sorry? Young chaps. Did yeah, you young, young chaps. Handsome, handsome, I, young yeah. old chaps. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> from 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 the beginning you you were both very transparent with us and sort of said look you know three people take to this and fly three people you know they just don't want it um 
and I think it was, you know, it was just so valuable having that transparency and openness um, <laughs> to the sessions. And, you know, even for me, it, it wasn't until probably three months after we finished the, the, the initial coaching that, that we did that something clicked. And it was just that consistent, you know, questioning. Um, there was no one right answer. It was, okay, here, here's some guidance. Um, you know, we're, we're here for you to ask questions. Um, and then when it did click, it, it, it really clicked. So, so in terms of Dr. Dale um, Child's question, have you seen yourself develop through your sales career? I guess the answer to that is yes. Yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's funny, it's um, both both professionally and personally. Um, I feel that I'm a more rounded human being now uh, because the because of the confidence that I've I've got from being natural and authentic and not necessarily having to put on a mask too much. And, and is that, do, do you, and what do you put that down to? I, I think it's, um, it, I think it comes down to bringing your whole self to work, right? Mm. Um, rather than creating those divisions. Okay. This is work me. This is home me, you know, on social, I'm sharing about, you know, the walk that I've just been on with my dog and, you know, the personal development that I'm going through and certain learnings and sort of trying to tie it all together and make sense of one with the other. And it, it just gives a, a, a more holistic view of things, um, helps to solve those problems faster, I think. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I think anyone that's, that's watched you on social over the last, I don't know, six or 12 months, will be thrilled at the change, um, you know, particularly now with the beard gone and the haircut, you know, it's just delightful. <clears throat> but but we've got a great comment here from uh, Danny Wareham. Uh, Do you think that media promotion of sales approaches and characters like the Wolf of Wall Street are helpful or a hindrance to attraction uh, to sales? And it's really interesting because uh, one of my early jobs um, the uh, the founder of the business was absolutely convinced that the world's best ever training video for salespeople was Glenn Gary Glenn Ross. Uh, you know, and this whole idea, coffee is for closers and sit down in this tough kind of brutal way of forcing people to do something they don't want to do was actually an attractive trait. And obviously, you know, I'm, I'm a lot older than you. So uh, uh, mental health, purpose, uh, enjoyment, those were never things that were on people's radar in those days. It was absolutely about rocking up at work and doing what you were told and getting the results and then going home at the end of the day when you lived your life. So, so do you think that, that, that uh, the media and, the, and these glamorous things like the Wolf of Wall Street, uh, they've been detrimental to getting the right people into sales? Yeah, certainly. I think the... <laughs> the biggest barrier is that stigma surrounding the profession. Um, and this, this idea that to be successful, you need to be a slimy conniving weasel. Um, and you know, no, don't hold back Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's sitting on the fence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, I think, you know, to, I think <clears throat> is, is this that sort of consultant, consultancy sort of approach um you know problem solving taking more of um that that sort of approach and uh you know it will films like the wolf of wall street will attract certain people and maybe that'll uh, add further to the stigma but um but yeah no i think that's the biggest challenge we face is is overcoming that stigma so, so one of the questions that we got um, that we've picked up was the fact that um, the Wall Street Journal said there was 700,000 uh, sales jobs, open sales jobs in the US. And we got into a discussion around what is it that's going to motivate people to go into sales? And, and really, you need to be motivating sales people to go into sales down at the school level. 
Now, your dad was in sales, so it's kind of like, it's a bit like, you know, my dad was a BBC sound engineer. It was very obvious that I was going to become a BBC sound engineer. So it was, you know, you kind of, um, and, and Adam was going to be an architect. So it's very, you know, following your father's footsteps is kind of easy. So what would it, what does it take, do you think, to be motivating um, a generation in, in schools to want to go into sales? That's a, a great question. Um, I, I don't know. It, I think there's an element of sort of business acumen that comes into it and having a natural interest to solving these business challenges. Um, and whether that that's enough to do it, um, I don't know. I think, it, again, uh, sorry, Alex, you were going to say something. Well, it's, prob it's probably worth noting um, that, uh, and tell me if this is incorrect, but you, I never encouraged you to no. go into sales. <clears throat> I encouraged you to do what you wanted to do. Yeah, certainly. But, but, but kind of, but, but Jordan, kind of speaking for a generation, mm -hmm. what would it get? What, if, if we're not getting enough people into sales... Um, and we may have these negative connotations in terms of what people see on, on film. What is it that, that's going to motivate people from schools to, to, to start filling these sales places? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's simply an open door policy. Um, one of the reasons that I was able to pick things up fairly quickly is because Alex was always willing to have a conversation and willing to answer my questions and I'm sure throughout the years I threw some pretty stupid questions your way but it was a patience to actually you know take a few steps back lay things out um, and, and just having that there was enough for me to to spark that desire to want to learn more and to 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 explore what a career in sales might look like and I think I mean, you know, yeah very cool. Hey Jordan, I thought you finished. No, go on. Um, well, I, I guess the other thing I would say is, um, uh, uh, as someone that struggled to be successful when I first made it into B two B sales, it took me seven years before I could hit my target <laughs> uh, consistently. Um, I, I had a really strong belief that if you know, so when Jordan decided he was going to take this path. I had this firm belief that it would never take him that long because he would have my guidance to perform sooner. I think, you know, I didn't have that. So I wanted to make sure Jordan had that. But, but I think what's, what's really interesting is from, from that comment, it took you seven years to get from standstill to be able to be a regular hitter of your target. Subsequently, you've you've not only been successful in sales, you've been successful in sales management, growing successful teams and mentoring people to be successful. So it it strikes me that for somebody even as good as you to go from an intro to sales to be a contributor to the sales function within an organization takes a degree of time. And it also strikes me that sales is a... a, a a pillar which absolutely doesn't give people that time <clears throat> you know it's quarter by quarter and you know to even even to grow a moderately successful salesman or salesperson is not a two-quarter job it's a multi-year job so how do we reconcile these two things how do we change the belief that that actually you're going to you're going to fall into sales and then immediately be hitting your number We've got, to, we've got to talk about the big boy problems, haven't we? Or the big person problems, frankly. I mean, sales for four decades has cultivated all of these personas. I did ask the lady who said, I wanted to matter, therefore I didn't want to do a sales job whether she'd come on. Uh, in fairness, no. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the key issue to that is, you know, every other part of business is talking about sustainability. No one talks about revenue sustainability, commercial sustainability, which is a multi-year process. Um, and, and I think that's part of the issue, Adam, is we don't talk about 
sales in the same serious context that most business talks about. Um, we don't Which talk is about ironic, it. isn't it, given that it is the single most important thing that any business can uh, do? Well, <laughs> well, it is for the business, but if you then look at it, and, and one of the reasons why a lot of people don't want to go in there is quite right now, I'm the oil in the San Andreas fault. So I've got my company over here that wants revenue and profit, and the customer over here increasingly wants a solution. And, mm-hmm. and those, those two don't necessarily, and Jordan hit on it, don't necessarily gel, yeah? So if, if you haven't got the solution, the company's still driving you, as you, know, you said, to shove somebody down a rabbit hole, you're there. And, and, mm-hmm. and nobody wants to do that anymore. Why, why would I want to do that? And in fact, actually, 20 years ago, I left Sun exactly because of that. I didn't want to be... I didn't want to be constantly trying to figure out how I hid the problems of my internal organization away from customers. Uh, I was just like, I've got better things to do. So why, I'm not sure why we're surprised that young people of Jordan's era are going, I've got better things to do than that. And the perceptions well, have, have not helped. Yeah, well, we've got a great question on that point here uh, from, from Neil. Does Jordan think there is enough help or guidance out there generally to help younger folks choose a career in sales? So, so is there is is there a repository somewhere? And and I kind of we we know Andy from the ISP would say yes, there is. It's us, uh, which is very true. But but is there something that people can find out there or an easy route for people to get the inspiration to go into sales as a as a career? No, even the ISP doesn't do it properly yet. And Neil Johnson is chair of our EPN, and that's where we'll need people like Jordan's help. Because if you look at four of us, we are looking back to join the dots, as, as Tim says. You know, we're, we're doing it. We've got to help the likes of Jordan looking forward. And, and you know, to, to Neil's point, is how do we walk beside these young professionals for their entirety of their career and say, we're your learning partner? We'll deliver learning and reward for that learning in a way that you want to in the modern world. It's not going to be a classroom, etc. And, and that's where the Emerging Professionals Network has been. We've been trying to kind of get it off the ground. Uh, and it's not quite working yet because, again, corporations are going, well, oh, it's fine. I don't need to worry about getting people enrolled in the Emerging Professionals Network because I'll just find somebody else. And it's not, it's not about them. It's about my number. <laughs> we were getting there, but actually, uh, Alex and I talked about it last week at Cranfield. How do we get and ask people like Jordan? How do we ask Ben Dork's daughter, who's loving sales, and surprise, surprise, he's the most successful salesperson in Nottinghamshire, you know, CEO of Idea Gen. There is that link where there is, I think, a generation coming through now who go, actually, I am into this because I've seen my mum and dad do it. And I actually do want to have something that helps me. Um, so I think there is, to a point, Adam, something just on the horizon. We just need to put a bit of energy behind it to, to get it into the, um, the places. Just, just, so, Jordan, can you, can you answer that question as well? Which is, um, uh, what yeah. is, the... is there enough guidance out there? Yes. I think, you know, there's a lot out there. Um, it's trying to muddle through what's actually useful and what's not but i think additionally what's real and what's not yeah exactly but i think additionally um if you're just starting out in sales if if your organization hasn't given you some sort of help which i think across the board there's a gross lack of support and enablement for young sales people within businesses you know in the last week i've had conversations with two people same age as me that have said no i've had enough one wants to move into a customer success role. As you mentioned, Andy, they, they didn't want to, you know, be rubbing people up the wrong way, forcing people. They wanted to solve the problems and help businesses to realise value, but they didn't want to be that person forcing someone down a rabbit hole. Um, and then the other, it was plainly because there was a complete lack of support and enablement, lack of direction. It was a case of here's your laptop, here's your telephone, go and hit your number. And when you say enablement, enablement is not learning how to put leads into the Salesforce system. No, no, not, not at all. It's, it's, you know, it could be as simple as 
how to have that conversation, how to have that first conversation to build rapport. You know, I think there's, for particularly for within sales development and business development, that front line, it's not about building rapport. It's it's about ticking a box and then throwing them over the fence. Um, and, you know, how do you expect a strong business relationship to be built on that basis? Yeah, really interesting. So, so obviously, you, you're, uh, you're a young guy. Uh, you've got loads of friends that are a similar sort of age to you. Uh, how, how often do you bump or do you ever bump into anyone that says, um, you know, what I want to do is to be in sales? You know, is is there any of that kind of uh, it, it's it's seen as a worthwhile, valiant thing for people to do within an organisation, or is it something that people do simply to certainly in the perception of young people simply do to tread water until their proper career takes off? Uh, yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it's a rarity. I think. Um, I mean following some of the posts that I've put on LinkedIn, people have reached out and sort of said, look, I'm, I'm wanting to pursue a career in sales and we've had a conversation, but um, I think it's, it's where I think there's within my friendship group, there's probably one other person that's in sales and he's in sales purely for, for the money and the, the golf on Fridays. <laughs> Yeah. But, but as long as he does a good job, that's not that's not a bad thing. As yeah. long as he as long as he delivers a solution, I mean, we've all been to golf days and stuff like that. So, I think you know the motivation of sheep, sheep dipping everybody in. Everybody wants purpose and to run out and replant the Amazon. We've got to be careful that that's a perfectly valid motivation. As long as he's ethical, as long as he does the right things, that that's okay too. Um, yes. Yeah. So what I really am interested in is you mentioned this natural fit a couple of times that you feel very natural in the environment and doing the things that you do. And there's some papers around that, and it's actually sparked by a conversation. I was at the, uh, the doctors yesterday and, and he was saying, you know, he's head of clinical practice for this private medical organization. He said, I have to go out and do pictures. And he said, and, and I hated it. I hate going out and doing it. And there's an, an argument now that, you know, if you think about sales as human, accountants and engineers and, you know, picking on Adam as not, everybody has to go sell now these days. Mm -hmm. And they actually feel really uncomfortable doing that part. And it's almost the imposter syndrome. So they kind of go, I'm really, I'm really comfortable as a doctor and a medical professional but actually, if I go out and do the commercial side, I have to completely, you know, I have to put another um, persona on and it really drags me down. And what I found was interesting, it's like, but you're a doctor. And he went, yeah. And I went, but surely inquiry is key to what you do. You're constantly asking your patients empathetic questions. You're doing things in a manner that actually are all the natural skills of a commercial person. And he went, yeah, I never thought of it like that. And it was like, that's the point. We've forgotten to sell as human and we've forgotten to actually celebrate what those natural pieces are. And, and I think part of the issue is as well, you know, every corner you turn around, sales is dead. I mean, we're looking at it now and, and Dale and I spent a long time, Matt raised this, this is why. We're all dead because AI is going to replace us all. <clears throat> Really, I'm not completely convinced by that. Um, but if that's what you hear, why would you want to progress a career in what you think is a dead, a, a dead profession? And actually, where is it beholden on us to actually say it's how you use AI that's going to help you be really, really successful, not you're going to get replaced by it. Because no one got replaced by Salesforce.com, other brands available. No one got replaced by LinkedIn other brands available. None of these technologies, and I think, Tim, you said this last week, none of these technologies have provided a seed change of success. We're still at 52% of people not actually being able to complete and close deals. So I think it's, we have got to, as a set of academics and professionals, got to actually take ownership of this now, as opposed to going, 
we've been operating for 50, 60 years without professionalizing. Now, now's the time we actually have to say no. We are as equally as valid. And, and let's pose that interesting question. Why do marketeers believe it's important to be professional and qualified, but salespeople don't? And surely well, I, I think that there's an element of, right, that, so, so we've got some great stuff going on in the chat here. Um, Paul has said this, you know, it's a job you do when you can't get a proper job. Uh, really, I think a lot of people view it in, in that way. And uh, Andy, hi, Andy, nice to see you. Uh, uh, this is not something that is an aspirational job for kids. You know, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a dentist. I want to be a marketer even these days because, you know, I get my CIM qualification or whatever. Uh, not I want to, to go into sales. And part of that is is kind of referenced here in Yayan's comment. Uh, uh, do What do we want to do when we leave education? Um, and actually, this is partly about the fact that in if you're in marketing or you're in medicine or you're in technology or you're in new product development, you're always learning new stuff. And although you're always learning new stuff when you're dealing with people in sales, the perception is that actually you're a salesperson, go out there and sell stuff, here's your bag, here's your car, away you go. And actually there is no education because it's not, you don't have to learn stuff, you just have to practice and refine those skills. So I think it's really interesting that we, we're kind of caught in this circular circular argument here, aren't we? Where uh, people don't want to join this because it's seen, although potentially quite lucrative, although less so now, a lucrative profession, it's a dead-end profession. I'm not going to learn anything. I'm not going to develop over time in sales. Yeah. But, well, yeah. I, I think on. that's changing in America which we're going to do a version of this for America, which is great. There's loads and loads of young people going through college. They're different types of programs. You can't say they're all degrees or whatever, but there's a greater desire for salespeople to go and at least get the foundational learning. Now, there's a big task to then take them post-formal education and then get them onto continuous professional development. In the UK, we're just starting that journey. Um, we've had three years of a diploma. We've had three years of degrees. Some people have gone through them in sales and got it. We still struggle to see them then going on to continue to learn through continuous professional development. Um, and, I, and I think that's because we still haven't grasped the fact that Jordan as a person is the person we need to enable for the rest of his career. Neil Johnson made it. It doesn't matter if he goes from Vidyard to... BMW and then from BMW to IBM, the, 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 the things that make him successful will help him be successful in any of those organizations. What we do is we actually say we're going to enable him. So actually he spends a lot of time getting product knowledge, a lot of time getting process knowledge, very little time actually getting those behavioral bits that really help him develop. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think um, the, I think the education side of things is, is really important. And I know, Jordan, you know, you went to university, you did really well, you got a first, it really meant something to you. And I've seen you um, sort of embrace the educational side of thing, things in sales. But what I also witnessed, what, 18 months ago, is you at the verge of giving it all up and not knowing where to turn because you were sick and tired of banging your head against the brick wall doing cold calling and cold emailing and getting no results so um and, and like you said your the two people that you spoke to recently have decided to move away from sales and i think this comes back to the exact point andy made earlier about this this uh, dichotomy we're in between what the business wants and what the customer wants and the salesperson being in the middle and if, uh, if businesses aren't taking responsibility to change that, we're not going to have any salespeople in the industry to be able to, to sell stuff. So, But you were lucky enough, Jordan, to see the light and feel the success. And then that's built your self-esteem and your confidence and a sense of purpose. Yeah, so how, I mean, how do, we, how do we get that to others? How do we bottle the fact yeah. that you found this sense of purpose? 
yeah. yeah, I I mean, just coming back to, to your point, Andy, that you made a while ago, some people are motivated by money. I think I think it sits with being true people leaders, finding out what motivates an individual and then tailoring what you're how you're teaching them, how you're coaching them towards that motivation. So for me, it was about this this idea of constant curiosity, um, you know, actually helping people, helping to solve a business challenge. And as you said, 18 months ago, I wasn't getting any of that. So how could I be passionate about doing what I'm doing? Uh, and that's how, you know, you, you go on those downward spirals. Well, that's how I felt. And that's how I entered that sort of downward spiral. And it wasn't until I could... Um, be more curious, you know, uh, be a little bit more creative, honour those values and passions of mine that then sort of triggered a, a reversal and put me on that upward spiral. And from there, the passion just grows and grows, or it did for me at least. So I think it, it's about really nailing into the individual and what motivates them and then tailoring whatever coaching you're giving towards that. What, one one comment I'd like to make as we approach 9.30 is that um, one of the things that we do need to discuss around trying to get people into sales is about diversity and inclusion. You know, here we are, uh, five white people, um, and there's the problem. Very good point. Um, and uh, five white males, and there's the problem. And and one of the things that we, you know, that, that here we are, we, you know, we, 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 there, there has to be not just about an ability to bring uh, young people in, but we need to be thinking about bringing young, young people in of of all abilities, all races, all religions, all, you know, you know, and 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 that's the, the that's the thing that the, or, or the exam question that we need to be answering. Yeah, we do. We do. You know, the reality of it is that let's let's take some bold steps. So if we can get Jordan back either next week or in a couple of weeks, let's go and get some more younger people and, and us old farts can step back for a couple of weeks and, and hear, actually, what do we need to do to support you? And what do we need? What do you think we need to do to, to entice people in? Because I think that'd be brilliant. So if we can get lots of young people on, we can hear what we need to do to support you. And we can hear from you what we need to do with schools, which is great. And, we and, get, and I think also the, the people in the comments who are uh, all people who are just like us um, get to hear it from the horse's mouth. Because yeah. actually it, it's one thing us banging our drum saying we need to do more of this, we need to do more of that. But actually Jordan is exactly the person that, that organisations are looking to recruit. And the organisations that are in the chat need to hear from Jordan and people like him, this is what I find attractive. This is what I'm looking for. This is what would encourage me to work within this industry or this kind of business. Yeah, I thought Danny's point there is completely agree. Unfortunately, Danny, it, it's it's a learned behaviour to say diversion and inclusivity, but you are spot on. It's inclusion first before you can be diverse. So you're exactly right. It's just and, learned and, and equity as well. Um, because um, I mean, it's a, that's a, a comment that's often used in diversity and inclusion uh, uh, discussions. But equity is the important part as well, because it's about making sure that everybody has the ability to to uh, uh, to, to to contribute. But what I really like about again um, Jordan's comment is there's a lot out there, and there is a lot out there on YouTube, and it's deciphering what's going to be helpful or what's written. I think Alex, you said actually what's real. We also suffer from our customers and our prospects seeing these five tips for smashing your, and I hate it, smashing your number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, it gets me to the point of, I actually want to smash your head because you've just, you, you've just done that Wolf of Wall Street. And there's, yeah. there's thousands out there. And luckily, there's not five top tips for flying an aircraft. And there's not five top tips for ne ne neurosurgery. Luckily enough, you know, the gag is it'll have you in stitches. But we are the only sodding industry that actually trashes itself with a plethora of people trying to sell sales training by going, follow my five top tips. Really? I mean, that doesn't yeah. work. Now, there are some cool stuff out there. There's some really reflective stuff out there, and it's buried. And it's actually part of the ISP's job and, and education's job to go, look at this, Jordan, because we quite like this. 
put the wrapper around it. But that's the thing is, how do you help young salespeople understand what is out there, aggregate it and give them and say, this is, this is actually really good five questions you'd ask at the start of a meeting. Right. We are within a few seconds of time. So uh, thank you, everybody on the panel. Thank you particularly, thank you. Jordan, for being, being our guest today. And thank you, everybody in the chat. Uh, Andy, Paul, Paul, Yian, Matt, Neil, uh, Dale, Danny and Karina. Thank you all so much for your contributions. Um, it's been a fantastic chat and certainly one that we need to pick up in the future. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all next week. So until then, thank you very much indeed.